cool. Oh, yeah, we we're going. This that is our sick. first uh, our first video pod. Yeah, first actual one. This is kind of a big deal. Is my hair looking good? <laughs> Looks great. You finally get to show off that uh, the mic stand you have. Oh, yeah. Look at this thing. Super nice. You know what I'm rocking right now? I got this makeshift. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. What <laughs> a little a cup holder that I got from my friend who lives in Australia. Like a little koala bear. Very cool. But it gets All the right. job done. It does. All right, let's hop into it. So what are we going to talk about today? Side hustles. Side hustles. We've heard a lot of demand from our viewers that they want to hear more <laughs> about this topic and how they can kind of get involved and make some money. Well, yeah, what's, a, what's a good, the, I guess, the I think the question was like, what's a good side hustle for me? And that's hard to answer in a general blanket statement, but I think let's give a couple ideas about side hustle or like what we think about side hustles in general. And then we can go into maybe some of the side hustles we've Examples. heard about slash done. And then we can go from there. So I'll give my first three main things I think about side hustles. The first, um, well, okay. Let me back up and say, this is all under the assumption that you're like between 18 to 25 and your goal with the side hustle is to, um, either make one make money. money or two like and your end goal is like make a bunch of money or something um and be like quote unquote successful because there's a lot of different reasons people do side hustles and maybe it's not all for the same reason but i think when you're young and you have a little bit of extra time you could be spending it like messing around and like doing stuff with your friends which is like important because it'll give you stuff but you could also be doing a side hustle to help you in the future so if under those circumstances, I think the three main things you need to think about are number one, are you learning? Number two, are you enjoying it? And number three, can you use leverage in this? All right. So learning, that's pretty obvious. If um, I want to do something in the future and this side hustle will help me be, be successful in that and learn skills on the way, that's, that's great. Um, number two, having fun. That's just like an important one because it's like, if you're just adding something to your schedule, you don't want to be a bunch, a big drag on you. You want to be something that like gives you energy instead of taking away energy. And then number three, um, you want some type of leverage. So this means that like, you're not basically just not just giving yourself a job. So if I was just giving myself a job and I was making like, I don't know, 15 bucks an hour, 20 bucks an hour during my side hustle, like that'd be fine. It'd be a little bit of extra income, but like in the long grand scheme of things, like it's not going to be that much more beneficial than actually just having a job. So leverage could be found in a, a few certain ways. So like first you could um, be building something that could be used in the future without your, your time being invested into it. So for example, like you could be building some type of like e-commerce site or something, or you could be building some type of like product um, like uh, maybe, maybe some type of like financial course or some, some type of course or something like that. So that way in the future, it could be um, like seen by people when you're not like technically making it or another way you could use leverage is by leveraging other people's time. Um, you'd be paying like a friend to like, say you're like mowing lawns or something. Um, you start like mowing lawns and then you source the lawns and then you have your friends that you're working like hourly to per lawn or you give them a, a cut uh, or, or of a lawn or however it works, right? So those are my three main things. What, what are the ways you think about side hustles in general before we get into some examples? So you covered a lot of what I was going to actually, what I was thinking about. So I didn't really, for me, I feel like with a side hustle, the joy comes in the hustle. So I feel like it doesn't have to be something that I find necessarily super exciting. Like mowing lawns is not something I would find exciting, but starting a side hustle that involves mowing lawns could be very exciting for me. So here's how I look at this. There's, there's two main types. One where you're trading your time for money, just like mowing lawns. And two, like you said, using leverage and coming up with a more scalable model where you are now hiring other people to do the job for you. So the way I see it is it's good to start out with that first option where find something you're an expert in, whether it's mowing lawns, um, creating slide decks, building financial models, be, be good at something and gain up a client base. Now, starting with the simple example of mowing lawns, right? If you're 18 to 25, you can go around your neighborhood, knock on the doors and be like, hey, do you want me to mow your lawn for half the price of what you'll pay some expert lawnmower to come do it for? Say it's a big neighborhood. It takes an hour 
or big houses in the neighborhood, it takes an hour to mow the lawn. And these houses would charge someone a uh, hundred, hundred bucks. And you come in and be like, Hey, I will do this for 50 bucks. Uh, if you let me do this, you start out mowing lawns for five or six of these houses, you build that client base. And then once you have those clients in place, that's when you can start outsourcing it and texting your neighborhood buddies and being like, Hey guys, um, does anyone want to mow this lawn for 25 bucks? Um, and if anyone's interested now you keep that $25, 50% profit, right? So now you do the marketing work after you've become the expert and all you are doing essentially is connecting the people who need the service with those who are pretty much willing to do the service. Um, I think that's how like a side hustle becomes much more scalable with leverage. Like you were saying. Yeah. I think out of my three, three things that I said, I don't think you necessarily need all three. I, I think the more, the better, but I think two out of three would probably be, probably be good. Like if you enjoyed it and you were learning stuff, but it wasn't like scalable or had any leverage, like it'd still be maybe worth your time. Um, I mean, there's opp opportunity cost to everything. So if there was something that you could be doing that would have all three of those um, like criteria, that would be better, obviously, but you don't necessarily need all three. I just think like the more the merrier in that, in that situation. Um, so I think you're right. Yeah. Like knowing and Lon's example, if you don't necessarily love it, but you're learning stuff and you're being able to use leverage, like that'd still be a good option. Yeah. So this summer, actually, um, one of my friends, I'm not going to mention her name right now, but she uh, she's an expert in slide design. Right. And so through some of her own personal connections, uh, there were some small startups that are like, hey, like, uh, do you want to help us make this pitch deck? We have all this information and we don't want to pay a big consulting firm. So can you you're a college student who has dabbled with this kinds of stuff? Can you do this for us? She said, yes, they paid they paid her a few few grand or something like that. And then she did a good job. And so those people at the startup ended up telling their other friends, hey, this girl did this work for us for much cheaper than the consulting firm would. And so she started to, through word of mouth, build like five or six clients, right, throughout the summer. Um, and she would be doing all this work herself. So it would take hours and hours to build these slide decks. That was what her specialty was. Um, and then she texted me. She was like, hey, um, I, I am doing this work for all these companies and I don't have time to do this one project right now do you want a few hundred bucks? Uh, do you want 60% of this, what I'm getting to just do this job for me? So I pretty much created like a slide deck for her uh, under an NDA that she was doing with the company. And she kept that 40% without having to actually do anything. All she did was connect someone who's willing to do the work, which was me with someone who needs the work done. Um, and so it's a win-win-win in that situation. So that could be a really interesting model. But I think for that, you have to first become the expert on the skill that's being done so that she could show me, here's my style. Here's how I make these slides uh, to keep the branding consistent for that client. Yeah. And that's how you, that's how you get those clients, right? So she was, she obviously did a good job. And so that's why the clients are like telling their, their friends, Hey, this girl does great work. You should hire her. And then she knew that you did good work so she could hire you. So it's kind of like one of those things where you get good at something, you do it over and over again, and then you build a client base and then you can use that client base as leverage for your side hustle. So what if, what if we're not an expert at something? So have you ever thought about doing something like this? Like, so there's these websites, right? Fiverr and Upwork where it's just freelancing tasks. So they have, uh, if, if you're a business, you can go there and get someone to do, that's how we got our logo done for, uh, this podcast, right? The cover art. Yeah. Um, you can get like graphic design work done. You can get slides done. You can get logos created, anything like that. Right. And digital marketing, and you can find these random freelancers. How many of those freelancers do you think outsource that work too? So those freelancers will get a task, Hey, create this logo for 50 bucks. And then that freelancer on Fiverr will reach out to someone offshore or one of their contacts be like, Hey, make this logo for $25. Um, I, I wonder how often that happens and how feasible of a model that is for like a side hustle where you don't have to be the expert in what you're doing. You just find someone who is. And yeah, it seems two. like it, it seems like it could work definitely. But the problem I see with Fiverr is as a marketplace, it's so price based to where um, people just go on there to get something done. And usually like you can have a couple of reviews, but usually it's going to be like, the differentiator is going to be your price. And so you have to keep fighting on price. Whereas like 
a less sophisticated market, like um, startups needing their pitch deck worked on or whatever. Um, it's not, you can go somewhere and see like a thousand people with all of their, their like stuff and just find one person that has, right. So it's a much, much less sophisticated market. And when there's a less sophisticated market, it's easier to differentiate yourself. Right. So for example, the mowing lawns, there's not like there, there might be a website you can go and look for like a bunch of different people, but there's not really that many people knocking on your door. Right. If you go on Fiverr, you could consider like these thousand people, like are all knocking your door saying, Hey, we'll do this work for like X dollars or whatever. Right. So the thing about Fiverr or platforms like that in general is like, you're losing out on the differentiating ability that you would have in a different market. Cause right? it's so competitive. Um, right. So like, okay, for example, I, I know a guy, he, he worked for an HVAC company. So he did a bunch of like HVAC work and then he would also do it on the side. Um, so he did a lot of HVAC work on the side and through that like time that he worked um, HVAC, he, he met like a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and he ended up like getting a lot of jobs from that um and so he's not the greatest contractor in the world um but he knows people that are so like he will like every month they'll come to like me and my dad and say like hey we i got a job for you like you want to do it and then he takes a cut on that just sourcing the job wow. so there's this one job where they're like remodeling a condo for this like rich old couple that like just wanted were downsizing, I think, because their kids were moving out and like they were retiring and they wanted their condo to be just the way they wanted it to be. So he knew those people. They asked him and then he subcontracted to, to like me and my dad. And then we subcontracted some of that to like somebody else. And then he took a cut on that. And then like it just goes down the line. And so it's like all about who sourced the, mm -hmm. the client. And then he made money to basically like just make sure the job was getting done. Like he would come over every once in a while and be like, oh, everything looked good. All right, cool. Or he's like, or he'd be the, the touch point between the, the two yeah. people or whatever. So it's things like that where it's not as sophisticated of a market, which can really like make your money by yeah. sourcing the clients. Because on Fiverr, like there's no money to be found in sourcing the clients really. Yeah, I guess like the way I see it, is like Fiverr, if you go and search up, I want a logo created, right? There yeah. will be a hundred different people creating logos. Therefore, it's extremely competitive and it's cheap because everyone's competing yeah. for price, right? So yeah. you'll find you could get a logo done for five bucks or like a resume reviewed for five bucks. Um, versus if you now have your own little business and your own uh, set of like connections and resources, then you could charge a little bit higher because they know you as like, because it's, pretty much easier to find you, right, for them. Um, so what this reminds me of is the difference between like Amaz selling on Amazon versus drop shipping. Because on Amazon, Amazon will take a big uh, cut, right? But there's more traffic coming to it. Same with Fiverr. Fiverr will take a big cut of that transaction because Fiverr is bringing all that traffic to your, yeah, to your freelance exactly. business. So to give some context around this second point I brought up, um, drop shipping. It's another, this is one example where I think you don't need to be an expert in the product or service you're selling in order to make money. So I, I dabbled with this a little bit. So drop shipping is this concept where say I have a drop shipping store called, uh, Rohan's, uh, pencils. Okay. Um, I will advertise these very, very unique pencils on Facebook and someone will be like, wow, I really want to buy this super unique pencil they'll click on my store and I don't actually have any inventory. When they click, uh, place this order for uh, $20 for this really unique pencil, what I will go do as a drop shipper is go to a uh, Chinese wholesaler like AliExpress or Alibaba. I will click fulfill on the order and I will ship the pencil that AliExpress has directly to the end customer. So for me, it might cost 10 bucks to buy this pencil from them and for for the customer, it might cost $20 to, the price would be $20 on my site. And I keep that $10 margin. Obviously there's more hidden costs as well, but that's the simple model to it. Where now no one's taking like a big cut of mine versus if I were to go sell this, do the same thing on Amazon, Amazon will take, I don't know what the fee is, 20 or 30% of that sale because they're the ones finding me that traffic rather than me having to do creative, uh, creating ads on Facebook. So it's an yeah. So one of the, one of the big things that we're, we're seeing is that like out of this conversation is just that, like the sourcing of the client 
is where a lot of the money is. Oh, and yeah. if you can be that person that's sourcing the client, that can be your cut. And then someone, you're just basically matching people, right? And so you're like a platform. So Amazon is a platform that matches sellers and buyers, right? And so they make a cut, that cut. Same with Fiber. They match people that are doing work and people that need work done. They're matching them, they take the cut. So if you can do that in your side hustle, like if you're mowing lawns, if you find the clients and you have a team of guys that mow lawns, you're making the, the sourcing fee basically. Um, yeah. So that's one way to make money. Same with drop shipping. Like you're, you're the one sourcing the like Alibaba is whoever's selling them. Yeah. Someone is trying to buy, you connect them, you make the difference. Right. So that's one way you can, you can do a side hustle. Another would be just like making a product. Right. So I know a guy. Well, one sec, one sec. Um, I think one yeah, other point on that first part, before we move on to another method, I think an additional uh, reason that someone would pay more for going through like so for the, the slides example with my friend, right? They're also paying for the trust. If I'm going on Fiverr and I want someone to make slides for me, it'll be some random person that you've never met. And there's that like lack of trust. Say I need this project done in two days and I go on Fiverr and their quality is not good, right? Versus if I trust this person to make good slides because of a trusted contact of mine told me about them and the quality of yeah. their work, I'm willing to pay a premium to get the slides done specifically from that person rather than going on Fiverr. So I think that's another Very thing. True. Right? For example, uh, babysitting, it's not something that has much leverage because you can't just be like, oh, um, as a freelancer, I'm going to babysit this kid, but actually I'm going to send this kid to another person to babysit for and keep the difference, right? Because the parent has to trust the person who uh, is babysitting. So that's another example where trust comes into play a lot there too. It's not just the- Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. But yeah, sorry so, to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, you're good. You're good. So I guess we can move on to, to like this other type of um, side hustle, right? And it'd be like more product based. So say you're selling a product. Um, this guy, I don't, I don't know specifically, but my friend, my friend knows him pretty well. I met him like one time. He was riding on his like his boat. They're on vacation. He was riding on his boat. The guy got like a, I don't know, $160,000 boat. Really nice, like wave, wave, boat, whatever it is. I don't know anything about boats, but he had this really ni nice boat. And my friend was, was talking to him about it. And he goes, yeah, this boat was 100% paid for by my side hustle. He's like, oh, what's that? And so this guy was telling him, he, got, he has an Etsy store mm -hmm. and he sells custom signs. So he has this like uh, the shop down in his like basement. It's like this big shop. It has like a CNC machine. I don't know if you know what that is. It's basically like a machine where you, you like put the, the wood down and then it has like a blade and then you can like program it. And so it just like mm -hmm. cuts it all. So anyways, he makes all these custom, custom, uh, signs for people. And he makes like, I don't know, probably 80, $80,000 a year or whatever, wow. not ton of leverage in that situation because like he could, I mean, potentially he could like pay someone else to like actually make it and then like do that, but he enjoys doing it. And he yeah. like, it's a high, high value, like skill to have. And also it's like kind of a high barrier to entry because like he had to pay like a decent amount of money to like get the, the machines themselves. Um, but it's also something like he really enjoys doing because like he enjoys like doing, you know, making wood, like woodwork and doing stuff like that. So that's like another thing where like, if you have something you can make, um, that like a lot of other people can't really make, you can make a lot of money from that. And you might not, you could leverage it by like teaching someone else how to make it and paying them like hourly to make the signs. Like he could have someone in his basement at all times, like making the signs, making the signs. He could be paying them like, I don't know, 20 bucks an hour or something. Yeah. And that'd be good for them. Um, are you like a high school kid or something? So like, there's always ways to do it. Right. And that'd be like more of a product based, yeah. um, I hustle. I have a, I have another example that kind of relates to that of a product based hustle actually in the art industry too. And it's an example of how you can turn something without leverage that takes time into something with leverage. So, um, summer after COVID or summer of COVID, my internship got canceled after freshman year. And I was like, okay, now what? Um, and so. I, I thought maybe this could be a cool summer to dabble with some sort of side hustle, right? So I was trying to think, what skills do I have? Uh, it was kind of difficult in the moment. Then, then it hit me. My sister and I have been making spray paint art for a long time, like the kinds of stuff you see on beach boardwalks or city streets of galaxies. So we've made that in our garage on and off. So I barged into my sister's room and I'm like, hey, Serena, like, let's, uh, let's, you have all this um, expertise. Why don't we build a course on it? That way we could get some passive income, teach people how to make spray paint art. So she's like, yeah, like we got so excited and we started building up this course and we were like 75% done with the course. And we realized like, 
wait a second, like no courses like this, no courses like this exist online. So we're like, oh, this is a perfect opportunity. Then we realized why those courses don't exist because there's not demand for it. Like you can go on YouTube and learn the same stuff. So we had to pivot a little bit because there was no demand. And so then we decided, why don't we start selling the actual paintings we make online on an e-commerce site called Simple Sprays? We're like, yes, perfect. And we started making all these paintings together. She was more of the artist. I was more of the business guy. Um, and now demand was too high where she was starting to get stressed out because there was way too many orders coming in and it takes an hour to make each painting. And sometimes you have to remake them. And so now we're like, okay, we've gotten to the point where we're making good money and we're trading time uh, for money pretty much. How do we take this a step further and kind of make this more passive? We thought, okay, instead of just selling the actual paintings, we should maybe try selling art prints. So what we would do is we would take a high quality photo of um, each of the paintings. Go, we found a print provider online who pretty much, they'll take our photo and put it onto a poster. And so now anytime someone comes on our website and says, I wanna order this galaxy painting or this balloon painting, we click fulfill and our print provider will ship the end customer um, uh, pretty much a poster of that painting. And we're very transparent about this on the website. We indicate they're not paying for a original spray paint art painting. And obviously our price point has to go down because of that as well. But now my sister doesn't get stressed about this so she can focus on other things um, and continuously like trying new creative ideas and making new paintings instead of making the same ones over and over again and starting to get bored of it, you know? So that's like another example of taking a product that you sell and trade your time for money and then making it scalable and uh, leveraging that. Yeah, I think there's something really beautiful that happened there in that situation that I think happened in a lot of the side hustles that we've been talking about. And it's, it's that you didn't necessarily just sit there and think for like a couple of months about like the perfect way to like, you didn't say, Oh, let's drop ship these paintings and let's do these paintings. And then like, we'll, we'll market them on tick. No, you didn't do that. You just said, okay, let's do something. So you made a course and then you realize, Oh, halfway through you're like, okay, that doesn't work. We'll do something else. So then you pivot and you do something else. You try it and it starts working and you say, okay, well now there's something new that we could try. And we try this and it, it works a little better and it works a little better. It works a little better. And it's that action that like continuously gives you feedback that you can continue to like grow upon. Right. And so we've like, and basically every single side hustle we talked about, it's all about action. Right. Mm -hmm. So mowing lawns, you went and you talked to a couple of people and you said, Hey, I'll, 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 I'll do, I'll do your lawn for half price. What the other people will charge you. And then they said, okay. And you start doing it and you say, Hmm, I'm doing all these lawns. Like maybe I can get my friend to do it. Help me with it. So yeah. you, your friend help you, they give you, give them a cut and then you keep going. And then you say, okay, well, um, you, you just keep going and you keep iterating and you keep doing it. And it's all about doing, doing, doing right. Same thing with any of these side hustles we talked about. Like it just comes down to having an, having an idea, doing it and then realizing, okay, I actually realized that now these are the pitfalls of the idea. I can do this. It's a little bit better. And you keep doing and doing and doing, and then you keep fixing just like little small things and going and going. And it, in the end, you had a totally different place than where you started, but it all, it didn't come from sitting down and thinking for six months about what was the best possible, most optimal way to make money in your free time, leveraging your skills, leveraging people, leveraging time, leveraging passive, all this type of stuff. It's not about that. It's about just having action, doing, reassessing, doing, reassessing, doing. Yeah. And so I would say like, if anyone's thinking about like doing some type of side hustle, it's not about finding the perfect side hustle for you. It's not about finding like the thing that you're amazing at or it's best or that you can leverage or you can do all these things. Like all those things are important and you should have it in your mind as you're going, but it's all about just like doing something and then moving and getting better and better, better, better. Exactly. Right? And, and like most of these side hustles that we've talked about are relatively risk-free where there's not a high investment cost to get started. There's just a lot of time and work that goes into them. And so if you fail, so be it, you learn a lot through the process. So yeah, like Jacob said, kind of just start with something and then pivot if it doesn't work, but you learn a lot in the process.